So we uh, we gave a lot of thought to this evening, and we didn't post it early on because, uh, first of all, the guys that plan this end up arguing all the time. But uh, we were trying to fine-tune it and figure out how we were going to go with it tonight. And this uh, grew out of... Um, um, out of a something in Kent's heart uh, with regards to the struggle of trying to make sense of what is going on in the church today. Uh, and, and I think many of you, if not most of you, can understand what I'm asking or what the rhetorically what Kent was asking himself. What is going on? And, and that's what I'm going to address from, from my perspective. You don't have to agree with me, but you know I've got the microphone and 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 so I will dominate this for the first part of the evening, and then I believe they're going to walk around and um, and and allow you to ask the question directly. Is that correct? Um, I'm going to begin. I don't want to be too dramatic, but I guess the image that I've been operating on or under for the last couple of years is. Um, is a biblical image out of Genesis, and it uh, it involves a big boat, a really big boat. And uh, I'm not worthy of the name, but I kind of look upon myself in Little South St. Paul as uh, as Noah trying to finish up an ark. Okay, and I don't mean to flatter myself when I say that, and maybe I'm not worthy of being Noah building the ark, but maybe I'm just one little guy one little uh, helper on the ark uh, saying, we've got to get this done uh, because the storm clouds are pretty much over us and something big and something bad is coming and it's coming soon. And, and I hear from a lot of people uh, the question or the observation, uh, there's something wrong or what's wrong. Not just in the church, but it really starts with the world, with with our nation. Uh, what is going on? Uh, it feels like 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 things are the reverse of what they used to be or what they should be, and and they can cite all sorts of examples, whether it's in politics or the economy um, or whatever. It just feels like things are very unstable, and to use a funeral image. It feels almost like there's this pall uh, coming over us, like we place over a, a, a casket. And I don't know if that sounds overly dramatic or not, but I have a sense that many of you have felt this foreboding that uh, that something's coming, and uh, it's not far off. We don't know exactly when or where it's coming from, but something's not quite right, or, or something's very wrong, I should say, uh, in the nation and in the world. At the same time, in the face of that is a time when we would want to look to the church, which is the ark for strength and for support and for answers. And yet I think many people are saying something's not right there either. Uh, I don't feel the stability. I don't feel the safety that I might have thought I would have had um, uh, earlier in my life or even a handful of years ago. So, so what is going on and what are we to do? So that's my operating premise is I really do believe there's something, frankly, apocalyptic coming. And I'm not saying the very end of the world. I don't know. It could. But it, it wouldn't be a surprise to me if the end of the world as we've known it and um, for uh, the, the, the world in which we have lived might be coming to face something um, um, quite frightening in, in some ways. But I'm not going to focus so much on the world. I'm going to focus on the church. And what I want to suggest is, from my perspective again, this lack of stability and uh, security that I feel and many others feel, I think has been in the works for some time. And uh, we're something like the frogs in the water that have become accustomed to many things, but now we realize um, we're being boiled alive. And, um, and now what are we going to do? What I want to suggest is at the root of this with regards to the church and actually society, um, there's a label that goes with it, and I think it describes um, so much of it, 
and and I'll use the labor label. Basically, I think what we have been laboring under is um, various forms of modernism. Um, I don't want to say for lack of a better word, but for a word that was first used in the early 20th century. And I want to speak uh, about the church and what I think have been the ravages and effects of this that have been going on and uh, underneath the surface for more than a century. Uh, it was Pope St. Pius X who really first vigorously addressed this in the early part of the 20th century, and he did it with encyclicals, he did it with a required oath, uh, he did it with a condemnations, uh, formal condemnations, but he described modernism as the most pernicious evil or enemy facing the church. The most pernicious. And by then he had 1900 years or nearly that of church history to look over and um, he um, did not describe Arianism. Uh, he didn't say that modernism was second only to Arianism. And while Arianism was very uh, divisive and widespread and very costly in many ways to the church, it was a, a single heresy, though a very serious heresy that denied the full divinity of Christ. And, um, but it was very specific. And people took sides on it. And uh, as often happened with heresies, eventually... Uh, the church prevailed, and uh, we came out of it stronger. This is more serious than the Aryan crisis. It's more serious than the schism uh, of the separation of the much of the eastern part of the church into uh, into orthodoxy. Um, and it's more serious than the very widespread um, collective heresies of the Protestants. I would say that um, it is a, a crisis in many ways more pernicious than all of these. And uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one is that it is um, it has uh, been able to operate in great secrecies and stealth. But especially, and I haven't named exactly what I mean by it, but I will, but that um, uh, it is as... Pope St. Pius said it is, in a sense, uh, embraces all heresies, all of them, and it continually morphs. He didn't say that, but I do. Uh, and I would like to, to quote one of my seminary professors who was every bit a modernist uh, from my uh, seminary days, who in a rare moment of uh, genuineness, while he was uh, lecturing uh, out of a modernist perspective, uh, said, and it was really uh, off the topic, but he said, the Protestant Reformation failed because it was done uh, from without the church. This time we will succeed because we will do it from within. Uh, and that kind of gets to the heart of what I'm saying, is uh, this is something that is within and has been within uh, for more than a century, and I think it's in, in full bloom now, and now we're finally seeing it and saying, oh my gosh, what is going on? Modernism had its roots in the 1800s. There was a modernism movement in the secular world, but also it made inroads into the church. And into the early 1900s, it was for the most part restrained because of the efforts of people like Pope St. Pius X, who vigorously attacked it uh, in various ways, including requiring all seminary professors, college and university professors, seminary rectors, uh, pastors, whatever, people in leadership positions in the church to take an oath against it, not that that would necessarily stop someone with uh, evil intentions. But really starting in the 60s, those, uh, those revolutionary 60s, uh, modernism emerged. It no longer had to be remain 
so much. Uh, it was not being uh, suppressed and restrained. And while it didn't identify itself or what it was, it started making inroads in uh, just about every aspect, started at least, of church life. Now, at the basis of modernism is a, a fundamental um, philosophical um, error, which is the reversal of the way that things are. We would say, or I would say, or the traditional church or scholastics would all say, that with regards to truth, truth is the correspondence of the mind to some reality. Okay, uh, Truth is when our mind corresponds to what something is. And so our minds don't make something to be true or false. It's simply that we have to learn what the truth is and then assent to it or reject it. Okay, So God reveals truths and we assent to them. But even on the natural level, we learn the truth of science um, through experience. Now, there are some philosophies out there that reject that, but fundamentally, the philosophy of the church has predominantly been that, that this, is, this is the definition of truth. But for the modernist, that is not the perspective. Truth is more the correspondence or the significance of reality to the subject. Okay? So it's not something objective and unchanging that we need to ascertain and then uh, uh, subscribe to or affirm, but somehow we are involved in the determination of truth. Something related to the satisfaction, the interior satisfaction or something imminent in us. And so truth is no longer something objective outside of us that is immutable and not determined by us, this now becomes more about self. In fact, in its extreme, it's all about self. It is selfish. And at the root of it is the sin of the fallen angels, ultimately pride. St. Pius X noted that it grows out of curiosity and pride, and uh, it succeeds because of ignorance. Now, the the thing that precedes modernism or enables it is this ignorance as well on a large scale. And what we found happening in the 20th century, especially towards the middle of it, is abandonment of some of the anchors that we had that protected us against this pernicious virus. Uh, abandonment of the church fathers, for instance, no longer regarded as relevant spiritually or for what they could offer in sacred scripture or tradition, the practice of the church. The widespread abandonment of scholasticism, even though on paper, even through the time of Pope John Paul II, still affirming that in seminaries this should be the fundamental form of philosophy and theology, to mystics specifically, St. Thomas Aquinas, no. Uh, I was blessed to be at the College of St. Thomas when the philosophy department there was absolutely to mystic and scholastic, and uh, that was a great anchor in the midst of the raging, crashing waves of much of the rest of the college, especially the theology department of the time. But that was an anomaly. You had to look far and wide, and that no longer exists. So the abandonment of the traditional philosophy and theology that had informed for centuries and centuries, almost half of the life of the church, uh, how we um, approached philosophy and theology. In fact, basically at the root of modernism, and I want to make it as simple as possible, is, um, is this view, namely, that all things are subject to change. All things are subject to change, and then their next step is this, therefore, everything should change. Everything is subject to change and should change. Make all things new. This was um, uh, part of a secular modernist poem, but it could be applied to modernism in the church as well. Make all things new. And I don't mean that in a good evangelical sense, you know, about being renewed in Christ and so on, but 
make all things new. So in a sense, it's a, it is a form of evolution that is unending. And what's very complicated about this is the modernist um, will, in one manner or another, say or believe that truth can change and that what is truth for one generation or one period or one culture may not be truth for another. Now, when I learned to mystic philosophy, we could say that, uh, that something cannot both be and not be. You can't have contradictions. And that's true with truth. But the modernist doesn't view it that way because truth is not something unchanging and objective. It is something more imminent. It is experiential. And so when truth loses its relevance, uh, what was true in the fourth century of the church, what was true for the Council of Nicaea, what was true uh, and articulated at Trent uh, is not necessarily true for us. And it's not just a matter of getting more precise language and developing concepts and so on. The church has always been open to that, uh, you know, developing philosophical languages and categories, um, you know, which is clear from the history of the church, even embracing Thomistic philosophy, you know, more than a thousand years after our Lord lived who himself went back to Aristotle in pre-Christian times for much of what he did. So it's not a denial that we can come to deeper understandings of mysteries, but again, understand this. Modernism believes that truth is not static. It's not just a matter of coming to a deeper understanding of it, but truth can change because somehow the subject uh, determines matters related to truth. So if your premise is that we... Uh, that things change, in fact, there should be this drive to make all things new and change, then it gets applied to the life of the church. Sacred tradition. So no longer can we be content with the expressions of, of the articles of faith, uh, that we accept the mysteries of the faith, or necessarily the practices of the church, but now these need to be uh, relevant to us. And so that can change. Once again, I'm not saying it's as simple as, as uh, simply better words to understand the same reality. No, the reality somehow is subject to change. Sacred scripture, and I'll give some examples. That was my field for several years. Uh, constantly, constantly seeking uh, to, to strip away what have been our presumptions about sacred scripture to replace them with something in, entirely novel and new? Sacred worship, uh, to constantly change the liturgy and uh, the structures of the church and the interiors of the church related to that, and ultimately the church herself and how we view her and, uh, and what she is, including in relationship to the world. So this modernism, which started to emerge in the 60s, and I can tell you in the field of Scripture, I eventually got to the point where I would go back to the pre-60 sources um, uh, after some point, after years of working in the field, to get to sources that I trusted, going back especially to the church fathers. But I could see the, uh, the, the, the restraint that held through basically the 50s and then suddenly the change going into the 60s. It was very noticeable in that particular discipline. So it affects sacred scripture, it affects sacred scripture, uh, sacred tradition, it affects our view of other religions. Because one of the movements of modernism is to give much less attention or to even uh, to dismiss this idea that there is one truth that there is one true religion, that there was one true path to Christ. And so this movement that is not any longer necessarily interreligious and ecumenical for the sake of bringing others to become Catholic has now come to embrace the differences as legitimate and acceptable. Multiple paths to truth, um, multiple true religions, even if not explicitly stated as such, that is the base of much of what has been taking place. I want to just walk through my own personal experience, even though um, this isn't about me, to show the, the frog in the water. Uh, because in one sense, from a young age, um, starting in the 60s, I was born in 57, looking back, I start to see all these changes. I, I, I can't say that I was deeply embedded in the 
pre-60s period because I don't have many memories, thank goodness, from age three and younger. Uh, so I don't remember, you know, other people having to change my diapers. Think that's not the kind of stuff you want to remember. You know, that, think about it. That's a grace, isn't it? Would you, would you want to be reminded of all of those things that 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 happened to you in the first couple three years of your life? Okay, but um, I I I had this desire to be a priest since age five, at least. I, I at eight because I have an experience in which. At about age five, my mother took me to a uh, house of studies for some reason because there was a, a relative there. Turns out it was, and I'm going to shiver when I say this, it was a Jesuit uh, house of studies. And uh, little did I know about the black robes then, what I know now after having studied under them for three years. But um, but I remember this, my mother meeting the like the headmaster there, and saying to him, my son wants to be a priest. And he said, oh, well, bring him here. You're having call. You know, we'd like to meet him. And she said, oh, he's here. And she pointed at me, and he laughed, you know, <laughs> and, and said, well, send him back in 20 years. And thank God I was only five, so I was never a Jesuit. Um, but at any rate, if you studied under them, you'd know what I was talking about. Okay. I've known a couple of good Jesuits. Um, but at any rate, um, <laughs> But, you know, it was, it was the sacred liturgy, and I was very young, you know, because the liturgy had changed by the end of the 60s, but it was that sacred liturgy, and my parents met in the church choir in those days, and, and, and you know, I would be in the church choir with them, but it was all of the smells and the bells and seeing what the priest did that made me want to be a priest in this church. Uh, and 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 do what the priest was doing in the sacred liturgy and whatever else he did as a pastor. So I just loved that, and um, and it just seemed natural to the point that uh, that that I would become a priest. But already, you know, in grade school, I started to see the changes at that time. You know, this would have been in the uh, in the sixties, and you could see it in visible ways. You know, with the religious, we had the Saint Joseph sisters, and they had all worn the full black habit and suddenly it was like modified and sister peter damien became sister julie you know uh, with tennis shoes instead of black boots and then all of a sudden sister julie's uh, hair covering came off and was a flaming bright red hairdo and it's like oh my gosh you know what happened here and 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 um and and it was like the the nun that used to beat us suddenly became the social justice advocate it was just Seriously, she used to beat kids. She, she, she could pick a kid up with his feet dangling by the chin and slap his face simultaneously. I watched that happen. And then she became Sister Julie with tennis shoes, w working in social justice in, in the uh, mountains of Kentucky. It's like, okay, but anyway. So, but, but, but it was more than just that, but at the same time, the catechisms were getting dumbed down. And, I was right on the cusp of that. My, my siblings who were two and three years younger were already getting less than I was getting, um, going through with regards to the religious education and the changes that were happening. So, you know, and then what also happened at that time, it'd be right around 1970, is we had this uh, beautiful Baroque uh, church over in Minneapolis, and um, I think it was Baroque, uh, but it was beautiful with the angels and painted on the walls and and the statues and everything else that was typical of the time and and the pastor closed it down for six months or so and when i walked back into that church i'm not making this up i was a kid i literally did not think i was in the church i thought i walked into the wrong building uh came in from the school side or up from the gym walked in and everything was green carpet and plastic chairs everything on the walls all whitewashed everything and um, and the tabernacle, of course, was hidden and inaccessible. And instead of the big crucifix, there was something that looked voodoo, you know, like straw and stuff uh, that was supposed to be a cross. Again, I'm just giving examples of, you know, and if you're 50 or older, or my age or older, or 90, you can remember maybe this stuff happening as well in your life. So then, and then inside the church, you know, all of a sudden you had the guitar mass. And you, you know, or then you had the full choir, um, you know, mass, and you could be choosing from all these masses and so on. We at least never had the clown mass, but but that stuff was going on. That stuff was going on, 
you know, and we became more and more casual about how we dressed and contemporary. And it's like, okay, it's another change, another change. Oh, here comes the sign of peace. Okay, okay. Here comes communion, you know, in the hand. Okay. Here comes Saturday vigil mass, you know. And I still remember the pastor when that was introduced. He said, this is only for people that really have a legitimate need that they can't go on Sunday. This is not a mass of convenience. This is for what we would now call first responders or people like Dr. Moore, you know, and others. This isn't convenience. Oh, yeah, that really worked out well, didn't it? Okay. Now, you can say, well, I think it's a good thing to have the vigil mass, but these things were all introduced with all these caveats and so on. Yeah. Um, or the changes in the, in the universal practice of abstinence. Now, you still have to do penance on Friday, but, you know, you can replace, uh, abstinence with something else. How's that working? How many Catholics even know that? That Friday, because Christ died on Friday, is always uh, a day of uh, of penance. Then I got into the high school seminary. Okay, and I hope I'm not boring you with my life, but I'm just talking this stuff through. Got into the high school seminary because I wanted to be that priest. And boy, they were really trending with it, with the change already in their chapel and um, and with the uh, pinball mass, as I call it. Because once a week, even though we had a chapel that still looked like a chapel, it was it was considered good to do class masses. And once in a while, we did it in the rec room next to pinball machines and pool tables. And you know, and I finally got disgusted with it and skipped out one night, went out and prayed the rosary, and I got detention for doing that. Uh, I had to work three hours hard labor on Sunday. By the way, you know what they do now? If you screwed up in the slightest when I was in seminary, the slightest, you you went to school Saturday mornings, and then you had to spend your Saturday afternoon doing manual labor for three hours, okay? That's what they did when it was a seminary. Now it's a juvenile detention center for sexual uh, uh, offenders, and if they screw up, they get a timeout chair. I, I, I mean, wow. So things have changed. But any rate, Things were really going downhill. And another thing I learned that's become a great danger in the church was there were also, frankly, and this is, uh, this is terrible to say, but, um, there were, um, homosexual predators, um, and activists emerging, um, from within that uh, community. And many of them to this day are, are now known and in house arrest, um, uh, kept away from any contact with any ministry or any kids. Um, and, but that was happening in the seventies, uh, all around me and, um, and, and, and it would continue. And that's it part of the root of the problem. And I found frankly that among those are the activists and those that are wanting to change. It's often caught up in this modernism spirit. There's a certain rebellion that's taking place. Everything's got to change, including moral norms. So at any rate, eventually got into a Catholic college after going in the Air Force and wow. Now I was finding modernism full force, but I still didn't necessarily recognize it, or I couldn't have named it at that time. But in my scripture studies, you know, constantly, if you weren't careful in choosing your professor, stripping away the historicity of the gospel. You know, the stories about Jesus didn't really multiply bread. He just convinced people to share what they had. You know, those stingy people that wouldn't otherwise have shared. Uh, Jesus didn't really walk on water, but he knew where all the stones were. You know, I've been to the Sea of Galilee, and you don't walk out very far on the stones, you know, at the Sea of Galilee. Uh, but, but, but you've heard it all, and, you know, and I'm taking notes on it and everything else, and it didn't sit right with me, but, you know, you take the notes, and then you try and exercise the mental uh, reservations. And, by the way, by the time I finished my scripture studies, and then I, you know, ended up going off to Rome, and then to Jerusalem, and then taught in the major seminary in the university in scripture, I, I, it always bothered me, but then I finally figured out what was going on. For instance, one of the insistent principles in modernism or modern biblical principles is that, that nearly all of the, uh, New Testament writings, for instance, are very late dated and, um, and they are not written by apostles or, um, uh, apostolic period writers. And so you're taking all these notes and so on, and then when you become a, a teacher or a writer, you repeat that. And if you don't, you're not going to get published, and you're not going to probably get hired 
uh, if you don't subscribe to the mainstream position on this. And so, you know, you say, oh, yeah, okay, Mark might have been the earliest uh, in the 70s, and then Matthew and Luke, you know, they were probably in the 80s. And then St. John, at one time they wanted to date up to 125 until they couldn't do that anymore. But I, when I finally realized why they were doing this, then I then it made sense, and then I totally rejected it. What, what, what they were doing with all this late dating is it was deeper than this. The ones that engineered this did not believe. They, they didn't have the faith. I'm not saying everybody that wrote it down and then repeated it. They were just the ones being misled. Some of them mislead. But, but the ones that engineered, for instance, this approach, they don't believe that Jesus had prophetic knowledge so that he could have spoken about things to come like the destruction of the temple. They don't believe that he had that kind of divine knowledge. And you could go, they don't believe that he necessarily could uh, perform miracles. They don't believe, well, what, do, what don't, what do they believe? I mean, I don't believe that they believe in the resurrection bodily, ultimately. And once I realized that's why there was this insistence on, for instance, all this late dating and later authors reflecting back their principles on an earlier period that I said, aha, now I know what's going on. And it had nothing to do with it. I wouldn't have anything to do with it anymore. But, but you know, I, I feel for so many in the field who, you know, who, who couldn't realize what was going on. They just took this as gospel truth because you couldn't find anything written after the, six, after the 50s that took a different position. And if you did, it was, it was obscure. It was uh, somebody who was ostracized um, by the whole community. So, you know, in college, in the uh, university, uh, you could see it in the theology. You could see it in the uh, scripture. As I said, the one saving grace in my time, thank God, was the philosophy department still had to mystic philosophy, although there were members of that administration that wanted that to change, and eventually it did, sadly. But then you get into the major seminary, and that's the major leagues. The major seminary was thoroughly corrupt, thoroughly corrupt. It was a spiritual Auschwitz. And that was pretty typical across the United States. And when I tell seminaries today some of the true stories about what was going on in the seminaries in my day, I think they find it hard to believe. Uh, if you prayed the rosary, you did it in secret, literally. You think that would be something to be encouraged in a seminary, right? No. You didn't want to get caught praying the rosary because, because with, with rare exception, the faculty and formation people were of the modernist uh, spirit and thinking. You didn't even use the word Pope, you know, Bishop of Rome, although now that's a popular title used by the Pope himself, but uh, there, was, there was not this allowance to give that kind of authority uh, to that kind of position. Because frankly, the modernists didn't even believe that Christ instituted St. Peter uh, in that position. I had one of the professors who taught in dogmatics come to me one time, because I was teaching scripture and I was teaching about the commission of St. Peter from St. Matthew's Gospel, which is specifically cited by Trent as the basis, biblical basis, to support the, uh, the papacy, starting with Peter, uh, Peter. And this professor came up to me, and he was a seminary professor, and he said, oh, Father John, you got to do something about this. There's some uh, seminarians in your class that actually think Jesus... Uh, commissioned Peter to be a pope or something, you know, that, that he, that he really did that. Like, of course he didn't do it. And I said, okay, okay, Father Pat, yeah, well, I'll talk to him. Don't worry about it, you know. But, but I just use that as an example. That was what was, what, what was not only common and acceptable, but it was what was required and demanded. And it was only by exercising mental reservations and, um, with sheer grace and tenacity, that many seminarians actually made it through the system. So the seminaries were by and large in the hands of radicals, progressives. In many seminaries, this homosexual element was very predominant and powerful, and sometimes not underground. Some seminaries were labeled as pink palaces, nicknamed that, and were known nationally because it would be more prominent there than in other places. And it was especially in the area of liturgy. 
that uh, that there was this uh, this this movement and control often in the hands of those that would either identify or be understood to be of of a uh, let, let's say of a um, homosexual persuasion to have control in that area in the life of the seminary. So contrary to what people think or what it should have been, um, literally these seminaries were places to weed out what would have been mainstream seminarians in any time past. We're not talking about, you know, radically unbalanced traditional seminarians who are lacking normal social skills or 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 have psychological problems, but many seminarians were sent to shrinks, you know, as a way of eliminating them. And when they sent them to normal shrinks and they came back with good reports, they started selecting um, their own shrinks uh, to to do their bidding. So so if you ever want to read about what was going on, read a book called Goodbye Good Men. Goodbye Good Men. Uh, Could have written it myself. Maybe I did. Okay. <laughs> any rate. Even statistically, look at what was going on coming out of the 60s. Tens of thousands, I suppose worldwide, hundreds of thousands of lost vocations um, of the religious communities, of diocesan priests. Um, and I don't know, if somebody wants to cast that as a good thing, I don't see how it's a good thing because following that are hospital systems that had been uh, staffed and operated by religious institutions either collapsed or they pretty much became somehow commercialized, uh, uh, and most of them are now. Uh, so some of our social services closed, and schools became a serious issue of how to sustain those. And and I can tell you right now, while for a while we were able to keep things going, um, this archdiocese is acknowledging that we probably can't sustain the school system as it exists and is looking at other ways other than parish-based schools to be able to continue to keep Catholic education, especially at the grade school level, going. So I, I, I don't see how that can be cast. And, and frankly, the closing of churches. Now, demographics does affect that. In uh, some cases, it's clear that an area is no longer populated, but it's more than demographics. Uh, statistically, 75% or more of Catholics aren't going to church in this country, in Europe, in many places it's worse. And, and so you don't have that base. And believe me, those statistics have to be accurate. I know they are. Uh, every funeral or wedding I do, uh, I can tell that in so many of them, uh, the next generation and third generation of a very devout grandparent don't even know what to do in church anymore. They're very uncomfortable being there. So you have the grandparent, and then you're lucky if one of the kids or a couple of the grandkids um, are even familiar with church any longer. Again, something is not right. Something has gone wrong. And when you're selling Catholic churches to Muslims uh, to become their temples of worship, whatever name you want to put on it, there's something terribly wrong. The Muslims are buying up churches left and right, including in the Twin Cities area. Uh, so... It doesn't have to be done by the sword. It can be done with the, uh, with, the, um, with the pocketbook. And now we get to some points where I would say we're becoming, you know, all this has been going on, and you have your own stories you could tell about what might have happened in your home parish or in your school and so on. There's some positive signs for some change that have came in the midst of this too uh, with regards to our seminaries and so on. But now we're seeing things at this uh, higher level that are coming out. And we're seeing and have been seeing statements coming from conferences of bishops taking positions on things. Sometimes it's a state conference. Sometimes it's a national conference. Uh, do we have to agree with, um, with their position statements on things? Um, frankly, no. Um, we're not told that, typically. I don't think they put a disclaimer that you're free to agree or not agree. I'll say that about tonight's talk. You're free to agree or disagree with me on this. But, you know, it was Cardinal Ratzinger, before he became Pope, who reminded the conferences of bishops in each nation, you don't have teaching authority. You do not have teaching authority. Okay? So you can gather for administrative purposes. You can take a position paper. Um, and much of what you do has to be approved by the Vatican. But you don't teach formally. Okay, doesn't mean you can't take positions. So, do I have to agree 
if the National Conference of Bishops takes a position that's uh, absolutely unqualified against capital punishment? No. You're free to agree. You're free to disagree. Okay? Um, but the long tradition of the church has had an openness under the appropriate conditions that a just authority could do that. By the way, I'm not going to tell you my position on it, but how many of you have seen the movie Taken? Yeah, one of my favorite scenes is when he puts that guy in that chair and uh, turns on the electrical switch. Anyway, so. <laughs> I don't have an unqualified position. I do have a position, but with qualifications. Are you required to agree with the conference on its statements with regards to immigration? I mean, that's the hot <laughs> issue today. They've taken positions on it. Do you have to agree um, with regards to the application of that? No. There are Catholic social principles that deal with justice and with regards to security and so on. But to take a formal position and put it out there, um, it's not a teaching. It's, it's a p position, and so you're certainly free to read it and consider it and then um, form an opinion based on that and in the context of other uh, input that you might have on this matter. Um, uh, except for the abortion uh, issue, as far as I know, the Conference of Bishops was supportive of universal health care. Um, is, that, is that a teaching? Are we required to agree with that? No. Okay. Now, some Catholics don't distinguish or understand that, and so when they hear a position is being taken, they think, okay, this is what the church teaches. No, the church um, actually um, uh, has more, shall we say, tolerance for the uh, exercise of choice in certain matters. Typically, the church will articulate principles, but as to their application, you know, like, like the principles that relate to, to our health and life and welfare, but the, the church has no history of teaching that there's some universal right to, um, to all aspects of health care, uh, no matter what. That, that's simply not a principle that, uh, that is articulated. And if it was, well, then we failed miserably up until the very recent times to, to, to live in accord with a standard that, that God would have set. With regards to um, interreligious um, and ecumenical dialogues and so on, um, again, there's a legitimate aspect to that that should fall under, I would say, evangelization. But uh, are we allowed to disagree if we have uh, leaders in the church who are now making statements that um, suggesting that that Islam could be a path to salvation, or that uh, Judaism or Lutheranism of themselves could be a path to salvation. There's certainly no history in the life of the church that would suggest that quite the opposite. And I'm not going to get into the big debate today, but but one of the movements within modernism is this idea of pluralism. There's a pluralism of truth. Truth changes. It can change over time. It can change and be different from one person or another because it depends upon the subject. Okay? That's why we're seeing so much going on with this with this religious accommodation or religious liberty. You know, whereas I would say this, that, um, that rights can only, rights come from God. I mean, you can have civil laws and so on that, that moderate a certain behavior, but not morality and, and religion. So, so, um, God may tolerate something to include a false religion or denomination, but is that, is there a right, an, an inborn right to worship, uh, a false God in a false religion? Well, you know, these are the issues, and um, and in times past, prior to the 60s, it was um, unheard of in anything official put out by the church that, that it was legitimate and desirable to somehow remain in some other religion or denomination. And then we're getting into now with the synod, and this is kind of, I think, what's really got people on edge, uh, this recent synod in which you have this seeming openness from an official church body with regards to the possibility of something positive or redemptive within homosexual unions and that somehow in a um, in a situation that objectively would be adultery namely divorce and remarriage um, that that somehow 
um, a person can be in good conscience and then the issue related to the sacraments uh, receive Holy Communion. You know, and the deeper reality is it's not just a specific prohibition or punitive measure for this specific group, that is, divorced and remarried. The, the practice of the church and the teaching that comes out of sacred scripture itself uh, is that if we are in an unworthy condition, if we are not in a state of grace, we must refrain from placing that which is most sacred into something which is not the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's right out of St. Paul. In fact, he says in the early church, that's why some of you have become sick and died. You unworthily took of the Holy Eucharist. So, so even the fact that the church or elements of the church are discussing this seriously and then passing it on to the next level of the synod um, are, are pretty frightening to, to, to one aspect of the church, very pleasing to another and to the world. Um, what I would like to suggest is um, when, when you reject God, you end up rejecting nature. And much of what's going on and why we're seeing so much focus right now on this whole issue of sexuality and homosexuality is, um, and this is, comes from St. Paul, uh, who speaks about the pagans. Once they abandoned the one true God and true worship, then they really abandoned their own nature. And he starts describing the perversions into which the pagan world fell. We are there. And the sad thing is, at the time when the church should be compassionate and solicitous to help people out of that lifestyle, yes, the church should still be strong in the face of overwhelming forces that are seeking to not only promote but force perversion upon, upon peoples and societies. The church um, is not only weak in standing against this, but does seem in some manners to be complicit. And we're hearing more and more and more of that. So what do, what do I propose in the face of this? Okay, um, We need to know the faith. I mean, the one thing that has helped me, and if you think I'm wrong, okay, then you think I need another kind of help. But, you know, I just buried my mother on Thursday. God bless her. And she was a teacher in Catholic schools, and her whole life was dedicated to serving the church. So I learned early on from her um, at home, not only the prayers, but uh, a lot of religion and theology, and was able to make a very important distinction early on. One thing I'll remember learning from my mother early on is to always be able to distinguish between the institutional aspect of the church and the mystical, the human element versus the divine. Okay, And the the ideal is that the human institutional church is in complete accord with the mystical supernatural. But that's not always the case because you have fallible human beings from all levels, from the ground level to the very top. And I don't have to go into the history of popes who were corrupt or anything else, but, um, but we know there's no, there's no absolute protection of infallibility and indefectibility for individuals. There are protections with regards to teachings and formal teachings, but things short of formal teachings coming out of synods, councils, and even popes are not necessarily infallible if they're not articulated as such formally. And we're not accustomed to that either. So we hear things from conferences or synods or from a pope, and it's like, that doesn't seem right. Do I have to believe that? You know, must I submit to that? Not necessarily. So you need to understand that distinction, and then you need to know the faith. And again, I'm grateful to my mother, but I'm also grateful to that to mystic scholastic philosophy that I had for four years in college. That was my major. That was my avocation. And that saved me, you know, because even though I would never hear it again in a classroom, in the major seminary, or since, you know, that sustained me. I, I was taught how to think and taught enough principles and history of what the church did teach to be able to sift through the rest, you know. And that's a blessing that not everybody has. But somehow you have to know the faith. And it can be as simple as, you know what I did? Again, I went back pre-60s. I did that in the scripture field. I went back to the church fathers. 
I went back to commentaries that came out of the early 1900s, and I pulled books out of the library that hadn't been taken out in 40 years. Seriously. You know, in those days, they still had the cards in the back. Do they still do that? You know, with the stamp of when it was last taken out? Some of those books hadn't been taken out in 30, 35, 40 years. And you feel kind of strange at first. It's like, there's something wrong with me? You know, because I thought, you know, and, and you're, when you're doing your bibliography, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I don't think this professor is going to like the fact that, uh, well, you know, but, but when I was teaching, I didn't have to show another professor my bibliography. And, um, they would have said, oh my God. Well, they would have said, well, that's Eckert. But, but, but seriously, <laughs> I had to go back and, you know, um, for somebody like a Scott Hahn, too, who became Catholic, uh, as I recall, he says it came through reading the Church Fathers. See, so he had to go back to earlier sources to get to the truth and get through all the stuff of the, uh, of the, uh, of the later 1900s and so on, whether it was in Protestantism or Catholicism. So even something simple like going back to Baltimore Catechisms, oh my gosh, the, the cursed uh, words, Baltimore Catechism, which was a catechism that came out of the Council of Baltimore, or whatever, you know, go through and, you know what, I'll say this, my, my father, very limited education as far as, you know, went into World War II right out of high school, but he knew whatever the truths were that were articulated in the Baltimore Catechism. Um, get down and make sure that you're fundamental on that. And, and there's so many resources now that didn't exist on the Internet. And I know there are a few of you who don't even have uh, telephones, and, 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 and answering machines because, because you don't trust technology and I don't either. But, um, you know, again, in my earlier study days and academics and everything else, the pre-web days, you know, it was hard to find books on the church fathers and so on. Uh, but these resources, they're all out there. You want to find an old good commentary on sacred scripture, type in Haydock. Uh, H-A-Y-D-O-C-K, Haydock Commentary. It's all online and it's free. And he collects the church fathers and everything else online and running scriptures. Um, so there are all kinds of resources, plus get connected. You know, stay informed of what's going on. I have my favorite websites I go to. Um, I like going to one called Pew Sitter. Uh, it links every day, you know, a dozen links or more. To, to stories and articles of what's going on in the life of the church. There are periodicals. Um, I know, Michael, Matt, can you think of any periodicals uh, online? <laughs> okay, so I know he publishes The Remnant, but, but there's a lot out there that didn't, 10 years ago, you couldn't access, and, um, and you need to stay connected. The other thing it does is you realize, I'm not alone. By the very fact that these sites exist and these links are here is saying, other people are getting it too. So get connected and, um, and, 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 and make use of these things that are out there, um, resources, but the connectivity of the internet. And then finally, you, you need to make sure that you're living the faith. And, you know, today I had a very hard call with a funeral issue. We finally resolved it, but, um, but it was for a funeral coming up and, and, and the one, the family member said, well, can can my two nieces read at the mass? And I said, "Well, are they practicing Catholics?" And he kind of scoffed at me sarcastically. Why? Well, what does that mean? You know, is it like once every three weeks? What? How many times a year do they have to go? And I said, "How about every Sunday?" You know, I mean, yeah, you know what it means. So be practicing the faith, but also if you have responsibility, if you're a father or grandfather, or whatever else, make sure you are protecting and leading your families. You know, and, and um, this is one of the differences between the modern religion and the religion of the time of Christ, Christianity, Catholicism, is in the time of Christ, the men led the family. In fact, the Jewish practice was, and I suspect it could have been early Christian as well, women and children were not required to go to the synagogue for the service, but the father was. And so, or the temple. And so the father would go, and then he would do the prayer, the worship, and the instruction, and come home, and then lead his family in prayer and in instruction. Okay? So I'm using that as an example. I'm not saying leave your kids at home, uh, unless they cry a lot, but don't, <laughs> but, but you don't have to leave your wife and kids at home, but, but that shows dramatically what the role of the father was. And, and so too, especially for sons, statistically, you know, if dad isn't going to church, the sons will drop off, you know, by the time they, they're able to rebel against mom. 
So, you know, maybe that doesn't apply to a whole lot of you, but obviously to some, and you're doing that by the fact that you brought your sons here tonight, lead your families or anybody that's entrusted to you. So, all right, so I don't want to just go on and, and, and gas at this point, but I'm going to go back and just finally summarize what I'm saying is um, I believe at the root of what has been happening, especially beginning in the mid part of the 20th century when the restraining forces were lifted by elements of the church herself, that um, we started to see a quiet revolution taking place that began impacting one area after another of church life. Uh, it affected the sacred liturgy and the sacraments, all of them rewritten. It affected the interior designs and the exterior appearances of churches. It affected the catechisms in our schools. It affected our religious communities and vocations. It affected um, our universities and seminaries early on. Um, it got to the pulpits in the parishes and it r rises all the way to the top in the life of the church. That's bound to happen. It just doesn't stay at the grassroots level. And now we've gotten to the point where it's even affecting fundamental morality and um, proposals that would, that would call into question what is not even divine law, but natural law itself. Um, and, and usually this is the point at which you look at a, an, a denomination like the the Episcopagans or the Lutherans, you know, and, and they start embracing, you know, open um, homosexual unions or they ordain lesbian bishops or whatever it might be, that's when you really know they've lost it. You know, they, they've totally fallen. They're totally tanked. We don't seem to be that far off, you know. We're still trying to pretend like we're remaining within our structure. You know what's going to happen when this next synod comes? Here's my prediction. It's going to be this game, and we're already hearing it, where we haven't changed our theology. We're just um, adjusting our pastoral practice. Guarantee you that's what's coming. We haven't changed our theology of the Eucharist um, or anything else one bit. We're just adjusting pastoral practice. And that's the way that, you know, that the water continues to boil without us being too uncomfortable. 